Greetings, everyone. It's a privilege to be able to speak to you today. I'd like to introduce the sermon today with a little story about an elderly couple that walked into a restaurant and the young lady who was the hostess met them and they said, we'd like a table for two. And the uh, young lady said, well, it'll only be about 30 minutes. You'll just need to wait. And the elderly man then looked at the young lady and he said, young lady, I'm 92 years old. And his voice quivered a little bit. He said, my wife is 91 years of age. We are up in years and we may not have 30 minutes to wait. You know, the young lady had a perspective on this situation as a young person. The elderly couple had another perspective on this situation. Uh, from an elderly uh, standpoint. Perspective is very important. What I'd like to do today is talk about a subject that can be viewed from a number of different perspectives. Some find this subject very exciting, very informative. Others find it, um, well, they're, they're skeptical. They're not convinced one way or the other. Some people think the subject is just crazy. It's off the wall, it's, it's way out there. And yet other people are rather indifferent to the subject. It doesn't apply to them, so they think, and they're not really, uh, they don't believe it's that important. But the subject I want to address is a long-standing teaching of the Church of God and of the living Church of God today. <clears throat> I'm going to keep you in suspense for just a little bit about the exact title. But I want to talk about something else for just a minute. I think most of you are aware that the teachings of the Church of God, the Living Church of God, are very different from mainstream Christianity, whether we're talking about Protestant Christianity, Catholic Christianity. We believe in keeping the Sabbath and not Sunday. We believe in keeping the Holy Days and not Christmas and Easter. We don't believe in a trinity. We follow the biblical health laws. You know, when a person dies, we believe they're dead. They don't float off into heaven and play a harp. Because of these different beliefs, the living church of God has been called a cult. And that's a derogatory term today, and many people find it very uncomfortable to be categorized as belonging to a cult. But you know, if you look up the definition of a cult, it's very interesting. A cult is defined as a religious group whose beliefs differ from the mainstream. In other words, their beliefs are unorthodox. They don't fit with mainstream Protestant or Catholic Christianity. But you know, I want to ask you a question to think about. If the beliefs of mainstream Christianity differ from the Bible, and the beliefs of the living church of God agree with the Bible, then who has the problem? If the beliefs of mainstream Christianity differ from the Bible, and the beliefs of the living church of God can be shown to agree with the Bible, then who has the problem? You can be called a cult, but if your ideas agree with the Bible, and the ideas of mainstream Christianity don't agree with the Bible, then it's not the living church of God that has the problem. You know, I was preparing a sermon recently on the real Jesus, and I came across some very interesting information that a number of prominent theologians down through history, especially in the last hundred years or so, have come to some very interesting conclusions. You may remember the German theologian, Albert Schweitzer. He also became a medical doctor and a missionary to Africa, a very accomplished theologian. He published a book in 1906 entitled <clears throat> The Quest for the Historical Jesus, in which, in which he basically uh, <clears throat> demonstrated that people that had ideas that Jesus didn't exist and some of these other way out ideas, he said, was just way off base. But one of the conclusions he came to was that the Jesus of the New Testament is not the Jesus 
of mainstream Christianity. The teachings of the New Testament are not the teachings of mainstream Christianity. In other words, he recognized that the Jesus that many people worship today and have pictures of today is not the Jesus of the Bible. Another individual, a Dr. Bart Ehrman, who is <clears throat> a theologian, considered one of the most prominent and most eminent uh, New Testament theologians today alive today. He's come to the same conclusions that Dr. Schweitzer did, that the Jesus of the New Testament and the teachings of the New Testament do not agree with mainstream Christianity. And what's interesting, I think, about uh, Dr. Ehrman is he was raised and grew up as a fundamentalist Christian. He believed in the Jesus that is taught by mainstream Christianity and the teachings of mainstream Christianity. He went to uh, <clears throat> uh, Protestant religious schools, and then he went to Princeton Theological Seminary in which he got a master's degree and a doctor's degree in theology. And he also lost his faith while he was there because he came to realize, again, that the Jesus of the New Testament is very different from the Jesus that he grew up believing in. You know, when God began to call and work with Mr. Herbert Armstrong, Mr. Armstrong came to see some of these same things, that the Jesus of the New Testament kept the Sabbath and kept the holy days. He didn't have long hair. He had a very powerful prophetic message about a judgment that was coming. <clears throat> and Mr. Armstrong began to see these things. The very same thing that Albert Schweitzer saw, the very same thing that uh, Dr. Bart Ehrman sees today. Before Mr. Armstrong died, um, <clears throat> we published a list of 18 truths that Mr. Armstrong felt were restored to the church during his ministry. He came in contact with Church of God people in about 1926. They were already keeping the Sabbath, so that wasn't something that needed to be restored to the church. They also understood about the name of the Church of God, that it comes from the New Testament. Some of them kept Pentecost, they were tithing, some of them, and they had an understanding, some of them did, of the biblical health laws. However, Mr. Armstrong felt that during his ministry, he was able to restore a knowledge of and an understanding of the biblical holy days, that they actually picture the plan of God that he's working out on this earth. He came to understand the purpose of life, that it was not to float off into heaven and become, you know, play on a uh, harp on the clouds and things like that, but that Jesus Christ was coming back to this earth to reign on this earth. And that Christians today can become part of God's family, spirit beings, to reign with Jesus Christ on this earth. He came to understand that only God is only calling a few today. He's only calling a few today. The rest will be called much later. That we're only begotten now and we will be born again when we become spirit beings when Christ returns. He came to understand the spirit in man, that there is a spirit in man that separates animals from human beings. You know, the brain of an animal, <clears throat> a chimpanzee, anatomically speaking, is not much different than a human brain. But what chimpanzees can do and can't do is very different from what human beings can do. And that's related to a spirit in man. <clears throat> one of the reasons for mentioning this is, and one of the reasons that Mr. Armstrong put together a list of 17 of uh, 18 truths, comes from Matthew 17, 11, verses 10 and 11, where Jesus' disciples had asked <clears throat> about a scripture that is mentioned in uh, Malachi. His disciples asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? They were aware of the scriptures in Malachi that said Elijah would precede the coming of Jesus Christ. And Jesus answered and said to them, indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. And then uh, down in verse 13, it says, uh, then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Now, when you go back and read the scriptures in uh, Malachi chapter 4, especially in verse 5, it mentions that, uh, let's go back there quickly and just look at that. 
It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, it doesn't mention that that applies to John the Baptist, but Jesus Christ applied it to John the Baptist. But the context of Matthew chapter, excuse me, the context of Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5 is at the end of the age. In other words, at the end of the age, prior to Jesus Christ coming, a person like Elijah would come. Now, some people think Elijah is going to be resurrected, but it's actually talking about someone would come in the spirit and the power of Elijah, They're kind of coming out of nowhere with a very powerful message. Mr. Armstrong read those scriptures, and he also read Isaiah 40, verse 3, about a voice crying in the wilderness that would prepare the way for Jesus Christ's second coming. And he tried to make that the focus of his ministry. And that was why he published the list of 18 truths that um, he's, he tried to restore and felt he did restore to the church of God during his ministry. But there's another truth that Mr. Armstrong felt that he restored. And it was listed as one of those 18 truths. And that other truth is the identity of the modern Israelite nations, which he felt was a key to understanding Bible prophecy. And I want to talk about that today. <clears throat> Mr. Armstrong did not invent the idea that the modern Israelite nations are America, Britain, nations of Northwestern Europe, and other British descended peoples. That idea had been around for more than a thousand years. And it was understood quite widely in the 1920s whenever Mr. Armstrong was being called and coming into contact with the Church of God. You know, the British Israel people had published numerous books on this subject, late 1800s, early 1900s. And those books were widely circulated. You know, I spent some time in Harvard Theological Library. One of the, the first times I went in, I was looking up this subject, and there were literally several shelves of books on this topic. So it's not some little tiny thing. It was widely known uh, during the early 1900s. But Mr. Armstrong came to see the importance of this idea and how it related to understanding Bible prophecy. He tried to convey this and convince the uh, Church of God people at that time that this was a vital key for understanding Bible prophecy, but they didn't buy the idea. And as a result, the message of the Church of God and the living Church of God is very different from the Sabbath keepers that Mr. Armstrong came in contact with. But I'd like to ask you a question again to think about <clears throat> as we get into the sermon today. What is your attitude towards this subject of the identity of the modern Israelite nations? Have you found it exciting and informative? You know, I did what I came in contact with the Church of God. It seemed to make more sense out of world history than anything I'd ever come across. But what is your attitude? Are you excited? Did you find the subject exciting and informative? Or do you have doubts about it? Well, I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure about that. Um, do you have a negative reaction to it? Well, I, I, I don't like that idea. You know, it's racist or it's this or it's that. Or do you have an indifferent attitude? Well, it's not that important. I, I don't think it's important at all. But I'd like you to just analyze for as a minute as we get started. What is your attitude towards the subject? Do you see how this subject relates to the plan of God? Do you see how it relates to you? And do you see how it relates to other people, to the peoples of this world? You know, the identity of the modern Israelite nations was one of the first doctrines that the worldwide church of God decided to get rid of. They began asking questions about it. They asked the ministry, what do you think about this doctrine, this teaching? Have you ever had any problems with it? Uh, those type of things. And then they began to actually make fun of it and undermine it and eventually discarded it. One of the books written by one of the young men that took over the, uh, the Worldwide Church of God described it as the central plank of our teachings. The identity of the Israelite nations, he said, was the central plank of the Church of God teachings. And he said, when that plank cracked, then the whole house of cards fell down. 
The truth is the central plank didn't crack. It was questioned, then it was ridiculed, and then it was rejected. And the primary reason for rejecting this doctrine was that the individuals that took over the Worldwide Church of God wanted to go mainstream and they had to get rid of anything that would prevent them from doing that. What was amazing to me looking back on that period of time is how so many people just readily accepted this new teaching. Well, it's not important, it's racist, uh, it, it doesn't relate to us today, it's an Old Testament teaching and it's totally ir irrelevant. I remember talking with the minister one time and asked him, I said, uh, what did you think of the questionnaire we, re we received that was asking a bunch of questions about the doctrine of the, and the teaching of the identity of Israel? And his response, he was an Ambassador to College graduate, he said, uh, I've never been interested in the subject. I've never been interested in the subject. And yet it's a fundamental key to understanding Bible prophecy. I remember talking with another individual from one another Church of God group. And I asked him, what are you going to do with these, the teaching of the America and Britain and prophecy? He had an interesting response. He said, we're not sure what to do with it. In other words, uh, we're, we're, not, we're not sure what to do with it. We don't see how it applies or whatever. I think there's still people in the Church of God today, even in the living Church of God, that are not sure about this subject. They're not convinced. Uh, they don't think it's important. But that's what I want to deal with in, in the sermon today. I want to talk about five arguments against the identity of Israel and how to defend this idea. I've given the sermon the title, Defending the Truth About Israel. Defending the Truth About Israel. And I want to talk about how some of these arguments were used to undermine the teaching that the Living Church of God has had and the Church of God has had for literally decades. What were the arguments that were used to discredit the idea? I want to examine those arguments and show that they really are baseless. They're interesting on the surface, but they really lack evidence and credibility when you look into the arguments. I'd like you to keep a couple principles in mind, biblical principles as we discuss this subject, defending the truth about Israel. You can jot these down, read them later, but read them and think about them. Paul mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, he writes there, prove all things, examine everything, and then hold on to those things that prove to be right and true. He'll get all the evidence for and against and see where that evidence lies, see what that evidence supports. In John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, free from doubts, free from confusion, so that you can focus actually on what is the truth. I was talking with a person not too long ago and they said, I've got a lot of friends that would just like to know what the truth really is. What is the truth? And they were talking about a number of different doctrines, not just the one we're going to talk about today. Because you've got you know, radio and television preachers, people on the internet, they're all claiming they have a piece of truth, they have a piece of truth. Many people wonder, what is the truth? Another principle, we'll mention it here and come back to it at the end of the sermon. In 1 Peter 3.15, Peter says there, always be ready to give a defense or a reason or many reasons for the hope that lies within you. If you believe something, nail it down so that you know that you know that you know that you know what the truth is. And if someone asks you, you don't have to make any excuses. You can say, look, this is the truth. This is what I have proven. This is where the evidence is. This is where you can find it. Again, Peter's advice, 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give a defense, to give a reason or many reasons for the hope that is within you. And when we understand this truth about the identity of Israel, it does give us hope. Whether we are physical Israelites, whether we're spiritual Israelites, doesn't matter. When we understand the big picture, there is hope for mankind 
in this truth. So let's go through five arguments against the identity of Israel, and we'll notice how we can defend against these arguments, how we can see through these arguments. <clears throat> the first argument, argument number one, claims that the idea of the identity of Israel is based on nothing more than fables and ignorance. It's based on nothing more than fables, stories, legends, and ignorance. One of the books that I've gone through by a Welsh scholar who makes fun of this idea, in spite of the fact that he travels the world looking for the lost uh, tribes of Israel, he says, no intelligent person, no intelligent, no educated person actually believes in this idea. Well, that's a big statement, but it's false. It's false. There are educated people today. There were educated people in the early 1900s. There were educated people in the 1800s. And there were educated people a thousand years ago that found this idea very convincing that the lost tribes of Israel actually migrated out of the Middle East into Northwest Europe, into England, Ireland, and Scotland, and then from there to Canada, to America, to South Africa, to Australia, New Zealand, and some other places. So the claim is there's no evidence in history, there's no evidence in archaeology, there's no evidence in anthropology. In fact, one person said you have to go outside the sciences and just ignore the evidence of science to believe in this idea. Well, again, these things are simply not true. But you find these arguments on the internet. You go into the uh, the internet, look up British Israelism, you'll find mainly evidence or arguments against the idea. Now, I gave a sermon previously entitled The Lost Key to Bible Prophecy, in which we went through uh, a number of bodies of evidence uh, that support this idea, both from history, archaeology, anthropology, even genetics point in this direction that support this idea that we have taught for decades. I'd like you to look quickly first at some of the biblical evidence. If we go to Genesis chapter 12, and again, if you've never done this, you really need to do this. Go through the book of Genesis starting in chapter 12 uh, through Genesis 49 and just notice how the promises, and these were prophetic promises, that God made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob and the sons of Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob, about what was going to happen in their future. And as you go through the book of evidence, you see these promises growing in scope. And they weren't just limited to the promised land. You know, some people think today that all these promises were filled and were fulfilled whenever the Israelites came into the land of Canaan. Didn't happen that way. Many of those promises were not fulfilled for more than 2,000 years. They have come true historically, and they're coming true today. But you notice in Genesis chapter 12, God began working here with Abraham. He says, get out of your country and from your family, from your family's house, from your father's house. Many of you have had to do that. When God opened your mind to understand the truth, you wound up leaving, in some cases, family, some cases, friends, some cases, neighborhoods, some cases, organizations. To a land that I will show you. I'm going to make you a great nation and I'm going to bless you. This is the beginning of the promises. And I will make your name great. In other words, when they hear your name, they're going to think, wow. You're coming from a great nation and you shall be a blessing. In other words, a blessing to the peoples of the world. This is mentioned a number of different times through the book of Genesis. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and in you or and in your descendants, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now that's not just uh, an editorial comment. That's not just an editorial comment. It's just not to fill space here. Whenever you look at history, you should be able to find a group of people who have become a blessing to the world you look at some of the things we take for granted today, electricity, radio, television, computers, the internal combustion engine, automobiles, airplanes, trains, steamships, the um, 
uh, the distributing of Bibles around the world. Who has done these things? Where did these developments come from? The developments of modern medicine and sanitation. Where did these things come from? They didn't come from Russia. They didn't come from China. They didn't come from Africa. They came basically from America and Britain and some of the Northwestern European nations. God was saying something here anciently. In your descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Again, we haven't done everything right. But by and large, America and Britain have been benign powers. We haven't been conquering all kinds of territory. We haven't been subjecting people. God made these statements and they have come true. In Genesis 22, verse 17... Genesis 22, verse 17, and also Genesis 24, 16. The promise is made there. Verse 17, In blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. In other words, you're going to expand, and as the sand of the sea. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In other words, at some point in time, your descendants are going to come to control, gain possession of the gates of their enemies, these narrow places around the world. One of the applications here is sea gates, the Panama Canal, the Suez Canal, the Straits of Gibraltar, the Straits of Malacca, the Bab el Mandez, the opening to the Red Sea, which actually means the Gate of Tears. It was the British and the Americans in the 1800s came to control these critical spots, and then they controlled world trade that made free trade around the world possible. Very specific promise, but it's been fulfilled. The Russians didn't fulfill that. The Chinese didn't fulfill that. Nations in Africa didn't fulfill that. The Jews didn't fulfill this promise. It was very specific. In Genesis 35, verse 11, now we're talking about biblical evidence that supports this idea that America and Britain, some of the Northwestern European nations, are the Israelites of today, Genesis 35 and verse 11. Another promise. God said to him, talking about Jacob, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings will come from your body. Promise here about a nation and a company of nations are going to arise from the descendants of Jacob. If we go to Genesis 48 then, this promise is narrowed down from the descendants of Jacob to the the sons of Joseph, Jacob's two grandsons. And Jacob was passing on a blessing to these sons. Normally you put your right hand on the oldest child, your left one on the youngest. But Jacob crossed his hands and he put his right hand on the youngest son. And he said, the youngest son will become a company of nations and the oldest son will become a great nation. And so who has become the single greatest nation on the face of the earth? The most powerful nation, the superpower. Uh, The United States. And there's been nobody that can touch that. Now we're beginning to decline today. We're beginning to decline today, but what other nation then became, or the descendants became a company of nations, a commonwealth of nations that came to control an empire that stretched around the world upon which the sun never set? It was not the Chinese. It was not the Japanese. It was not the Russians. It was not some of the European nations, in spite of the fact that Spain and France did control some countries around the world. But nobody has come close to fulfilling that other than the British-speaking peoples. These are powerful principles, brethren. Uh, The biblical evidence that is provided supports this idea in a very powerful way. The descendants of especially uh, Ephraim or Britain spread around the world, became a colonizing people, settled in some of the choice places of the earth. But that is exactly what these promises say. One other biblical point I want to make here, and then we'll touch on it a little bit later, in Genesis 49. Because some people think, well, this is all Old Testament. It doesn't relate to us today. 
But in Genesis 49, Jacob looked down through history as he was um, blessing these children. But now he's talking here about the rest of the Israelite nations, all 12 tribes. Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may show you what shall befall you in the last days. So here's a prophecy that looks ahead to the end of the age. And in Genesis 49, he, he mentions characteristics. He's prophesying. By the end of the age, you will be able to recognize each one of the 12 tribes or the descendants of these 12 tribes by specific characteristics. In verse 8, he talks about Judah. This was one of the 12 sons. And talks about the um, scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from his feet until Shiloh or the Messiah comes. And the prophecy is that the Messiah will come from the descendants of Judah. And that's where Jesus Christ came. He was a Jew. He came to uh, the nation of Judah. But there's characteristics of all the other 12 tribes. But when you get to the end of the age, what Jacob is saying is look back over history and you'll be able to identify who these people are and where these people are by these characteristics that will be very obvious in their history. Now this is the biblical evidence, some of the biblical evidence that supports this idea that the American peoples, the British peoples, peoples of Canada, Australia, New Zealand and other places are Israelite peoples. There are numerous historical sources that confirm all these things happened, that the Israelites migrated out of the Middle East into Northwestern Europe. Educated individuals, as I mentioned, down through history have believed these things. Very interesting case of a man by the name of Maimonides. He was a Jewish philosopher, lived about 1100. He was born in Spain, uh, grew up in Northwest Africa, and I believe died in Egypt. He was considered one of, the, one of the preeminent Jewish scholars of his age. And he basically felt very strongly that the Israelite peoples were to be found in northwestern Europe and the British Isles. You know, he, was, he was not an uneducated person. Many others have fallen uh, into the same line. Evidence, for example, from the Behistun Rock. This is carvings on the side of a, a rock mountain in western Iraq, uh, in western Iraq. It's called the Behistun Rock and there are cuneiform carvings there, actually carvings in cuneiform Greek and some other languages. And they basically say that the, uh, uh, <clears throat> they connect the Israelites with the Scythians. They connect the Israelites with the Scythians. They called the Israelites Qumri. Qumri. The Welsh today call themselves Qumri. Where did they get the name? Qumri was a name that was used by the Babylonians and the, um, um, the Assyrians for the Israelites. There is archaeological evidence then that supports the Scottish Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Our Broth, uh, written in the 1300s, put together in the 1300s. Basically, say the Scots came from Scythia. This was the area around uh, um, the eastern part of the U Ukraine, southern Russia. And this is one of the areas where the Israelites migrated to. But the Scottish Declaration of Independence say that their ancestors came from Scythia. So you find these connections. There is evidence if people are willing to look for it. Many of the critics today ignore this evidence. In some cases, they may not even know that it exists, but it's there. The point I want to make is, number one, one of the arguments against the identity of Israel is that it's just based on fables and stories and there's nothing that, no, no really solid evidence, but that is simply not true. The evidence is there. As I mentioned, I went through quite a bit of this evidence in a sermon that I'd given recently entitled The Lost Key to Bible Prophecy. Okay, a second argument that tries to undermine the identity of Israel. And this argument is basically, it's just not important. It's not important for Christians today. It's no longer relevant to New Testament Christians. And besides, it's been used to support racism 
and uh, exploitation of other peoples and slavery. Uh, we just don't want to talk about it. It's not important. It's embarrassing. More of the argument, or more ideas that support this argument, they say, look, your national identity has nothing to do with your standing before God, which is true. But that still begs the question. Oftentimes the scripture is used in Galatians 3.28 where Paul says neither Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, male nor female, we're all one in Christ. Now Paul is talking about spiritual Israelites as we will see in a couple of other scriptures. Paul is not addressing this subject of physical Israelites and where they went and the promises to them. He's talking about spiritual Israelites. Others will argue that the knowledge of national identity doesn't forgive sins. Again, we're talking spiritually here. It's not a matter of salvation. You don't have to be an Israelite to be saved, so to speak. Uh, they will basically say, too, the mission of the church is to preach the gospel, and that means believing in Jesus, that he died for our sins. We need to repent and that God loves you. But none of these things address this issue of physical Israelites, where they are, where they went, the promises that were fulfilled. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins is only part of the mission of the church. There are other missions that are mentioned. In Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, you know, especially in, Mark 20, in Matthew 24, the disciples came to Christ as what's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. How are we going to know we're getting close to the end of the age? And then Jesus went through a series of signs of false teachers that would come, of famines and earthquakes, wars and rumors of wars, a lot of things like that. He said, watch for these things. But about half a dozen times in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Jesus said, watch. Watch for these signs. Now, some people say today that the, we don't have to watch world news. We just have to watch our attitudes. Well, we do need to watch our attitudes, but Jesus was talking about world events. And he said, you watch for these things because as they build and you see these things happening on a global scale, that you better watch and be ready. Don't be taken by surprise. You know, part of the mission of the church is explaining to people what is going to happen to function as a watchman to explain, look, these, are things are, these things are happening. They're described in the Bible. We need to be ready for these things. We need to understand what they mean. This was the mission that God gave to Ezekiel. Read chapter 2 of Ezekiel, chapter 3 and chapter 33 of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel was told, I want you to be a watchman to the house of Israel. A watchman to the house of Israel. The house of Israel had already been carried into captivity over a hundred years before. They were in captivity. And yet Ezekiel had a message about a coming captivity. It was a hundred years too late if that was the only application of those instructions. What Ezekiel is being told actually is a prophetic. There's, there's a duality in prophecy. Ezekiel fulfilled the initial fulfillment. Someone else is going to have to fulfill the ultimate uh, meaning of that, that, that prophecy or that warning. People in the night have got to be told. They've got to be warned about what is coming. You know, this was why God sent prophets to ancient Israel to warn them before they uh, declined and went into captivity. Bible prophecy indicates our nations today, the Israelite nations, are going to go into captivity. They're going to be punished. They're going to go down the tubes. And God hasn't forgotten to warn modern Israelite nations because even the world is going to learn some lessons for what the Israelites are going to go through. You know, in Jeremiah chapter 30, let's turn there quickly, and we'll see that Jeremiah's message was not just limited to ancient Israel. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 2, he's told to write in a book the words that I have spoken to you. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, I will bring back from captivity my people Israel. So they're going to come back from a captivity, my people of Israel and Judah. Notice he's talking to two different nations here. Israel and Judah. In verse 7, he says, 
Alas, for that day is great. Now, this is talking about a coming tribulation, as we'll see as we get to the very end of this chapter. So that there's none like it. You know, Jesus mentions in Matthew 24 that unless Jesus, uh, God intervenes, sending Jesus Christ back, no flesh would be saved. There's nothing like in history what is going to happen in the years just ahead. We have a warning message to deliver. He said, there's nothing like it. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob had 12 sons. Those 12 sons grew into 12 tribes and then 12 nations that spread around the world. He said, the end of the age is going to be a time of Jacob's trouble. How do we know it's going to be at the end of the age? Go to verse 24 at the very end of chapter 30. He says, the fierce anger of the Lord will not return. God is going to bring these punishments until he has done it, until he has performed the intents of his heart. And then it says in his very last sentence of chapter 30, verse 24, in the latter days you will consider it. In the latter days, all of this is going to make sense. You're going to see what all this means in the latter days at the end of the age. You know, this is not an unimportant subject, the identity of the Israelite nations. They were blessed by God. They were used by God. God wanted to use the Israelites. He gave them his law. He wanted to use them as an example for the world, to be a light to the world. But ancient Israel turned away. They went off in a different direction. The modern Israelite nations have been blessed according to the promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But we too are going off in a different direction. And we're going to be held re accountable, responsible for what we're doing. You know, one of the, the instructions to Ezekiel, you read this in Ezekiel 3, you read it, read it in Ezekiel 33. It said, when you see the, 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 the trouble coming, you are to sound an alarm. And if people listen to that and they're, uh, <clears throat> they're spared, then you will be spared. But if you sound an alarm, excuse me, if you don't sound an alarm and people die, their blood is going to be on your shoulders. There is an Ezekiel type warning that needs to be delivered today. And that is part of the mission of the church to deliver that message. This is not an unimportant subject. Yes, it has been used by some to exploit other people. But you know, atomic energy can be used to generate electricity. It can be used to create atomic bombs. Money can be used to buy drugs. Money can be used to purchase a home. This concept of understanding the identity of Israel doesn't mean that they're better than anybody else, the physical Israelites. It merely means God wanted to use them. He gave them certain laws to follow that would bring them blessings so that other people could see and ask the question, look, you're being blessed. How, how do you do that? Show me how. That was the intent. It's a very important subject. It's not just some little thing. And it is relevant to New Testament Christians today and is relevant to the church today because it defines our mission. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 6, he says, I want you to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I want you to go. And the disciples knew where to go when you follow the movements of the 12 disciples. Thomas went to Western India because there are Israelites over there. Andrew went up into Southern Russia, Scythia, the Crimea, because there were Israelites there. Paul went to Spain, he went through Asia Minor, but he also went to Britain, as did several other of the apostles and the disciples. Why did they go there? There were Israelites there. They had migrated there. So when you follow the movements of the 12 disciples, you identify where they went. Our mission is to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. To fulfill that mission, you have to know who these people are and where they are because they're going to be punished by God for turning away from him and his way and his laws, and they need to be told. So that's number two. The identity of Israel is important. This idea that it's not important is totally wrong. Argument number three, and this becomes a racial type of thing. It says the Jews are the real Israelites. The Jews are the real Israelites. These prophecies about Israel don't apply to Christians today. Again, this is wrong. What the people that use this argument don't understand, 
And you go back to 1 Kings chapter 12. When Solomon died, the United Kingdom that was ruled over by David and Solomon split apart. His son, Rehoboam, wound up ruling over the Jews, the tribe of Judah, and some of Benjamin and Levite, and the Levites. But the bulk of the ten tribes were told basically by Jeroboam, he says, to your tents, O Israel, we're out of here. We're not going to follow Rehoboam because he's coming down on us too hard. And they established the northern nation of Israel, basically made up of the ten tribes. And they functioned independently for several hundred years. Sometimes they fought with the uh, nation of Judah. Sometimes they were allied with the nation of Judah. But they wound up going in different directions. The ten tribes in the north, their, head, their capital city was Samaria. The other tribes, uh, basically two tribes in Judah, uh, Benjamin, Judah, and some of the Levites were in the south. Now, the arguments are raised that, well, you know, they got together later. I'll give you a couple of scriptures. You can look them up. Second Chronicles 15, Second Chronicles 15, verses 8 and 9, Second Chronicles 34, verse 9. Some of the people in the north, in the northern ten tribes, the nation of Israel, did migrate back to the south whenever, Jerob whenever, Re whenever Jeroboam introduced idol worship. So some did migrate back to the south. During some of the uh, revivals under some of the uh, uh, kings of Judah, some came back. But that doesn't mean that everybody came back because you still have these promises that the descendants of Joseph, Ephraim, Manasseh would become a nation and a company of nations that would gain control of the gates of their enemies. The Jews never did that. The Jews never did that. This was fulfilled by America and by Britain. And they had to exist in order to be able to fulfill those promises. In, uh, <clears throat> we saw in Jeremiah 30, Verse 3, that Israel and Judah would return from a captivity in the latter days. So they've got to be separate because the Bible indicates the Jews will come back and the Israelites will come back. In Hosea chapter 5, verse 5 and verse 13, it mentions that Israel, the nations of Israel, Ephraim, and Judah would stumble together. And the Jews are primarily in the little nation of Israel in the Middle East. Again, they're scattered other places, but Israel is a, a central point for them. But it says Judah will stumble, or the Jews, or the little nation of Israel will stumble together with Israel. America is in trouble today. Britain is in trouble today. South Africa, Australia is in trouble today. And we're all probably going to go down together indicating these prophecies are real. They're happening today. The Jews are not the only Israelites. This is the important thing to remember. The Bible talks about Israel, the ten nations in the north. It talks about Judah uh, and uh, Benjamin and Levi in the south. The Bible distinguishes between Israel and Judah. Many people today think that the Israelites, excuse me, that the Jews in Israel are the Israelites. Well, they're part of. But remember, Jacob had 12 sons. The Jews, Judah, were only one of those sons. A fourth argument against the idea that America and Britain are Israelites <clears throat> is another one that is kind of racist in its tone. But this argument states that the black races, primarily the African Americans, are the real Israelites, and that their idea has been their identity has been stolen by the Jews and by the Anglo Saxons. Now, this is it's a different idea, but there's a body of, of literature. Not real big, but um, there are books on the subject. You can go on the internet, look up black Israelites, and you'll find information. Basically, the idea developed in the late 1870s. This was about you know, five, ten years after the Civil War. Developed in Kansas, then spread back to Chicago and New York. This was a period of time when they were looking for Israelites all over the place, all around the world. Some people felt they found them in, in China. Some people found they felt they found them in South America among the Indians there. Others felt that they uh, found them uh, <clears throat> in Africa. When Thomas Jefferson sent uh, Lewis and Clark to explore the Northwest, 
one of the one of the requests that he made of them was look for the lost tribes of Israel among the Indians in the northwest part of the United States. So this idea was around. This idea was around. Uh, <clears throat> some enterprising, apparently a young enterprise or an enterprising black man came to the conclusion that the 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 blacks in America must be the lost ten tribes, or they must be Israelites. One of the things this did was that this idea gave freed blacks, freed slaves, a sense of importance, and it made the whites and the Jews targets of their anger. In fact, I was listening to a black preacher uh, on the internet recently. He really was wound up, and he said, you know, the, the Jews and the Anglo-Saxons have taken our identity. We are the true uh, Israelites. And so this idea apparently developed as a, as, as a backlash against the racism of whites and Jews. And, and all this is based on the idea that you know, we're better than somebody else, we're, we're special. Now, white Europeans have had that idea, and the Jews have had that idea. You know, they look at the, uh, uh, the non-Jewish races as goyim, in other words, the, the common people, uh, and they are the chosen people. And then uh, this idea of black Israel does the same thing from a black perspective. Now, when you look through the arguments, I want to just touch on this quickly. Uh, there's a number of scriptures that are used to support this idea. The, the theoretical idea is that the races developed from the three sons of Noah. The white race came from the descendants of Shem, the black races came from the descendants of Ham, and the yellow races came from the descendants of Japheth. And this is a li an idea that's been around for quite some time. When you follow the genealogies, the Egyptians and the Canaanites appear to have come from Ham. So therefore, the conclusion is Egyptians must be black. As we'll see, that's not necessarily the case when you look at the evidence. And a number of examples are mentioned that Joseph, we read about in uh, <clears throat> Genesis 41, verse 45, that Joseph married the daughter of the priest of On. In other words, a woman from Egypt. On, when you look up on the, the ancient maps, is a little bit north of Cairo, uh, modern Cairo, and it's up on the edge of the delta. There was a lot of people moving through that area that were lighter skinned. So the assumption is that the black Israelites make is that because the woman was uh, the daughter of the priest of On, then she must have been black because the assumption is that the Egyptians were black. And yet the Hyksos invaded the Delta, conquered the Delta. And they came from basically uh, the Palestine area, Canaanite area, but it doesn't say what color they were. The Hyksos, though, when they moved into and conquered the Delta area, they adopted the religion, they adopted the dress. As we'll see in just a little bit, they apparently were lighter skinned people. So you can't conclude that Joseph married a black person just from this one verse. Uh, Moses is called an Egyptian. Whenever he fled from Egypt and was drawing water in uh, the land of Moab, he's called an Egyptian. But that's like calling an American uh, or calling a person an American and assuming he's a particular color. You, know, you look at America today, we've got black people, we've got white people, we've got Native American people. Uh, <clears throat> we have Asian people that are living here. So you, you can't just take a word that labels a country and say that also labels a race. Bathsheba. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> the woman that David had an affair with. Uh, the claim is that she was a black person because Uriah was a Hittite and he was black. And yet we'll see from some of the Egyptian art, the Hittites weren't black. They were light-skinned people. So these are some of the arguments that are used. If you go to Psalm, <clears throat> no, the Song of Solomon. If you go to the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, in verse 5, this is one of the verses that is used to prove that um, the Israelites were black. 
And we, ju we just need to be able to, to see through some of these arguments. The Song of Solomon is a love song between a man and a woman, possibly Solomon and possibly a woman that he was in love with. Um, and they have their parts. One, one person will say some things for several verses, then another person responds. The man says something, then the woman says something. The Shulamite, which is the woman, says, Rightly do they love you. I am dark, but lovely. I think the old King James says, I am black, but lovely. The Hebrew word is shahot, S-A-H-O-T, shahot, which means dark or swarthy, a darker person, swarthy person, possibly a black person. Um, Verse 6, it says, do not look upon me because I am dark. Again, the older King James says black. But notice what the next verse says, because the sun has tanned me. In other words, I'm dark because the sun has tanned me. It doesn't say she's a black person. It says the sun has tanned her. Then if you go to uh, chapter 5 and verse 10, we find Solomon responding and talking with, uh, no, no, this is, again, this is the woman talking, but it's describing the man, describing Solomon. It says, my beloved is white and ruddy. This is Solomon. Chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy uh, and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves. His body, verse 14, is like carved ivory. His legs are like pillars of marble. She's describing uh, the body of the man. But said, my beloved is white. So you can't have Solomon being a black person uh, if the description here in the Song of Solomon says something else. Now this is some of the arguments that are mentioned. What I'd like to do is look at some pictures then that illustrate what we're talking about. In other words, you can have a theory that the Israelites were black. But it's got to agree with the evidence. Remember, Paul mentions to prove all things and hold fast to those things that are right and true. When you look at the evidence from Egyptian art and Egyptian artifacts, you find some very interesting things. Semites as being white. They show Hamites being black. And they show people of Japhethic uh, coming from Japheth as yellow. You see this in some of the art. Another picture that we'll look at, that Egyptian art shows people of different races. And you see this quite vividly on tomb paintings. You see it in other pieces of art. The Egyptian art shows people from Nubia, this is the southern part of Egypt, towards the Sudan, as being very black people. And this is in the artwork uh, and in the ceramics. It shows Egyptians as kind of a reddish brown people, not black sort of reddish brown and it shows other people uh, as being white in some cases the Hebrews are shown as being white so they're not black some of the Egyptian ceramics and these are painted ceramics and then they're fired so the paint has stayed they show the same thing as um, Egyptians being uh, reddish brown it shows the people coming out of Asia Minor uh, as being white. It shows the Hittites as being light-skinned. And it shows Nubians, people that are very black, coming from the south of Egypt. In fact, one of the issues of the um, <coughs> Biblical Archaeology Review, it's a magazine uh, that publishes information about archaeology, actually had a cover article suggesting that the Israelites were light-skinned people. So this is what the evidence shows. <coughs> Also, some very interesting tomb paintings show slaves making bricks. Now, in Exodus, you, we read that the Israelites were enslaved and they had to make bricks. Some of the, the tomb paintings show slaves making bricks. Some of them are light-skinned and some of them are darker-skinned. But this would again fit with the biblical evidence. Another very interesting painting in one of the tombs shows that Egypt was a really a multiracial society. And when you look at these, these paintings, you see some white women, some darker-skinned women, and then some other darker-skinned people. 
So when you look at the evidence from the tomb paintings, the artwork, the ceramic work that comes from ancient Egypt, you can't conclude and you can't assume that all the Egyptians were black. It, it just doesn't fit with the evidence. This is an erroneous conclusion. It doesn't fit. Egypt apparently was a multiracial society, very much like our society today is very multiracial. Now, why is this important? Why talk about this? Basically this, the sad truth is, the sad truth is that neither white Israelites nor black Israelites nor red brown Israelites, whatever, fully understand the plan of God. Everybody wants to be this chosen people. The promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were physical promises, that their physical nation would be blessed. But you know, God chose the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, when they were slaves. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. He gave them his laws, and that was what would set them apart from the rest of the world so they could be lights to the world. But when you look at Romans chapter 11, let's go there quickly. Romans chapter 11, Paul is talking to the church in Rome. There were many Gentiles there. There were many Gentiles in that congregation. And he spends a couple of chapters talking to these people, but he's talking about spiritual things. He's talking about spiritual promises and spiritual opportunities. He talks about the Israelites, talking about the physical Israelites who become blind. Verse 11, I say to you, they have stumbled that they should, uh, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. In other words, they're not out of God's plan and purpose. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy has come, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And he's talking to Gentiles. They stumbled, he says in verse 20, because of unbelief. They were broken off. God is not, uh, well, he is concerned about them, but he has another part of his plan. Verse 25, <clears throat> For I do not desire, brethren, he's talking to the Gentiles, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, Israel has been blinded. They don't see who they are. God is now bringing Gentiles into the church on the same footing. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, Paul says, The church is the Israel of God. God is calling Gentiles, people from other colors, other races, other cultures, to understand the truth. Not everybody, but some. And they're spiritual Israelites. We become spiritual Israelites when we come into the church of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, and also chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, Paul mentions there the Gentiles are spiritual Israelites. They've come into spiritual Israel and they're fellow heirs with Christ. So it doesn't matter whether you're black, whether you're brown, whether you're white, whether you're yellow, whatever. This has nothing to do with your standing before God. You've been called out of this world to come into the church of God, to become part of the plan of God. When we understand it, God's plan is inclusive. It doesn't exclude. Now, that's the spiritual dimension, but that the, the physical promises are still there. The physical promises are still there. To be called by God doesn't make us better, doesn't make us exclusive, but it is an opportunity that we need to understand. Okay, the final argument. <clears throat> the final argument is that the United States is the beast. Uh, the U.S. is not an Israelite nation that's going to be in captivity at the end of the age. It's going to be the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. Now, where does this come from? It comes from a very different understanding of Revelation chapter 13, a very different understanding of the two beasts in Revelation 13. We have taught, and I believe history supports the idea, that the first beast is going to be a revived civil government that has links to the Roman Empire, a, 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 a revived civil government in Europe that is related to the Roman Empire. The second beast that we have taught is going to be a prominent religious figure coming from a very prominent church, very possibly the Catholic Church, that does miracles. It does miracles. The United States doesn't do miracles. But in the Catholic religion, you've got statues that bleed or statues that cry tears. Uh, 
visions of the Virgin Mary that appears on hillsides or the sides of a building in Eastern Europe. These type of things attract people's attention. You know, when you compare <coughs> Revelation 13 with Daniel chapter 2, the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 2 is the Roman Empire, has ten toes. Revelation 13 and 17 has ten horns. We're going to see ten kings or ten nations or ten groupings uh, of uh, nations in Europe that is going to uh, appear towards the end of the age. A woman is going to ride that beast that has ten horns. A woman is symbolic of a church, not a nation. So our explanation for Revelation 13, Revelation 17, uh, the beast being a ten nations from Europe, the woman riding the beast being the Catholic Church, actually fits with history. It fits with scripture. It fits with the history through the Middle Ages. Uh, it does not a fit, doesn't fit with the United States being uh, one of the beasts of Revelation. These arguments are basically put forward to undermine this idea that America and Britain and the other Israelite nations are the Israelites of the Bible. Uh, <clears throat> none of these arguments, when you really look into them, are very convincing at all. They're, they rest on assumptions and they rest on rejecting other things. This idea that the United States is the beast totally points people in a wrong direction. You know, we have been blessed because we're Israelite nations. We're going to lose those blessings, and this is a message that needs to be delivered. Now, why is this important to you? Why is this subject important to the living church of God? Again, if you look at some basic scriptures in John 6, and 65, Jesus said, No one can come to me except the Father draws him. You know, a calling is a capacity to understand the plan of God and to understand the truth of God. This is not happening to everyone today. Matthew 13, verses 10 to 17, Jesus said to his disciples, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. God is not giving that vision and that understanding to everyone today, only to those that he's calling. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 20. 9, Paul says, only the few are called right now. Not many wise, not many mighty are called, but only a few are called right now. And you have been given that opportunity. And it's something we never want to take lightly. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 to 16 says that it's God's spirit that enables us to understand the mystery or the plan of God. It's God's spirit that enables us to understand. Our mission today is to preach the gospel and warn the world, to deliver a message. To do that effectively, especially to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, you have to know who these people are and where they are. And God has given us that understanding as a church. You know, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21, Peter said, look, we didn't use cunningly devised fables. We didn't base these teachings on fables and legends, but on, we were eyewitnesses. You know, the, the apostles in Christ's time knew where the 12 tribes had gone. But in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, the old King James says that the church has a more sure word of prophecy. We understand things that the world doesn't understand, and we've got to use that understanding to preach the gospel in a very powerful way. Brethren, we need to value our calling and we need to grasp the importance of our mission. And this mission involves preaching the gospel and warning the world as well as the Israelite nations about what is going to come and what is going to happen. I would encourage you to study the subject about the real identity of Israel. Don't take this for granted. It applies to you whatever race you come from, whatever nationality it comes from, or you come from, is a key to understanding Bible prophecy. If you have doubts or questions about the subject, ask those questions. Ask your minister. Get answers. Don't sit on doubts. Don't let it roll around in your head. If you're indifferent to the subject and you feel it's not that important, you might ask God to help you get the big picture, help you see the big picture. It's there. 
It's developed through the book of Genesis. It runs through other scriptures throughout the Bible as part of Bible prophecy. It's not some little thing. As we conclude, I'd just merely like to say, don't let anyone rob you of your crown by using some of these cunning arguments. Once you look into the arguments and you prove what is right and true, you need to hang on to those things. And again, the scripture I mentioned in the very beginning, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where Peter said, always be ready to give a defense, to give a reason, to show the evidence for the hope that it lies within you with meekness and with fear. What I've tried to do in the sermon today is to show basically there are arguments against the identity of Israel, but those arguments are fallacious, they're full of holes, and you need to be able to defend this idea, a very powerful idea, of the identity of the modern Israelite nations.